autopsy of counsel in DLA Piper's San Diego office. Today, my international colleagues and I will discuss managing your transactional risks, liability limitations, and exclusions. I will give you the view under U.S. law. The limitation of liability provisions in a commercial contract is one of the most, if not the most important provision in a contract, as it enables the parties to mitigate and control risk. In the U.S., contracting parties are generally free to limit their liability. However, since the U.S. does not have a federal statute regarding contractual limitations of liability, the enforceability of such provisions is a matter of the state law of each of the 50 states. While state laws differ, there are some commonalities. First, such provisions are generally enforceable unless the limitation is unconscionable, such as a limitation against public policy or where bargaining powers are vastly unequal. Second, some states do not permit limitations on a party's liability for willful misconduct, gross negligence, or fraud. And finally, in general, limitations of liability clauses will need to be clear and conspicuous. While parties are generally free to limit their liability, a key distinction in the U.S. for fashioning enforceable limits will depend on whether the contract is a business-to-business -business or a business-to-consumer contract with some state laws restricting the types of enforceable limitations in business-to-consumer arrangements. By contrast, in B2B contracts, most jurisdictions tend to take the position that the limitations of liability negotiated by commercial parties are enforceable. A limitation of liability clause will typically consist of two parts, a waiver or disclaimer of specific types of damages and a cap on liability. The waiver or disclaimer of certain types of damages seeks to limit liability to direct damages by excluding liability for other types of damages such as consequential, indirect, incidental, and punitive damages. These other types of damages are difficult to quantify and may exceed the direct damages suffered by the injured party. For example, consequential damages are not foreseeable and do not flow directly from the breach but occur due to the special circumstance of the breach or the injured party. Typically, lost profits, damages relating to third-party claims, and property damage are considered consequential damages. Due to the uncertainty regarding these, contracting parties may seek to exclude liability for such damages. One point about lost profits. You may see a disclaimer of damages that expressly disclaims liability for lost profits. While lost profits are often considered a con consequential damage, depending on the circumstances, they could be determined to be a direct damage, such as if the party bargained for such par profits as part of the contract, or they are the direct and immediate fruits of the contract, distinguishable from lost profits for collateral arrangements. The second aspect of the limitation of liability provision is the cap on liability. This cap seeks to provide certainty by limiting the maximum liability to a known amount. The liability cap is often expressed as a specific dollar amount or tied to the fees under the contract. Many contracts will also contain exclusions from the limitation of liability provisions that go beyond the exclusions for fraud, gross negligence, and willful misconduct previously mentioned. These exclusions may include brief of, breach of confidentiality, intellectual property infringement, and a party's indemnity and obligations. The exclusions to the limitations of li liability provisions are often heavily negotiated. The failure to carve out exceptions from the disclaimer of consequential and other damages may leave a party without sufficient remedy for the other party's breach. For example, a breach of confidentiality not carved out from the disclaimer of consequential damages may leave the disclosing party with only direct damages, which may be insufficient or hard to quantify. Limitations of liability provisions are an enforceable and useful tool that enable the parties to manage and mitigate risk and liability. Hi, my name is Trina. I'm a legal director in our Irish office, and I will be giving you the view under Irish law. Ireland is a common law system and recognizes the freedom to contract. In other words, parties are generally free to agree contractual limits to liability. That said, there are some restrictions on limiting liability. For example, the enforceability of certain limitations on liability will depend on whether the context is a B2B contract versus a consumer contract. And it is not possible to exclude or limit liability for misrepresentation unless fair and reasonable to do so.
The structure of a limitation li of liability clause in an Irish law governed contract typically consists of three parts. Firstly, a provision setting out the types of losses for which liability is not limited or excluded. Secondly, the exclusion of specific types of losses. And lastly, a cap on liability for all other losses. A typical limitation of liability clause will detail the losses for which liability is not excluded or limited, including the losses that the parties have agreed will not be subject to any limitations or exclusions on recovery, for example, confidentiality breaches. A practice has also emerged in Ireland of contractually agreeing to not exclude or limit liability for deaths or personal injury caused by negligence, even though it is not strictly necessary to include this into a, in a B2B contract under Irish law. And there will usually be a general reference to any losses which cannot be limited as a matter of law. A typical clause will include a disclaimer of indirect and other types of losses. These types of losses are often hard to quantify. In general, indirect, also known as consequential losses, are losses that do not arise in the normal course of events. That is, they are caused by special circumstances of a particular breach that were not in the reasonable contemplation of the parties. But it's important to note that if the losses do arise naturally from the breach and in the normal course of events, then they are recoverable as direct losses. This can mean that losses such as loss of profit and loss of goodwill can be recoverable if they are found to be direct losses. A limitation of liability clause in an Irish law governed contract will typically include an exclusion of liability for all indirect losses and will enumerate certain heads of loss, for example, loss of profits and loss of goodwill, for which the parties contractually agree to exclude recovery of loss. This allows some certainty when assessing potential risk exposure under a contract. Irish contracts will also usually include a liability cap. This also seeks to provide some certainty by limiting a party's liability to a known amount. In some circumstances, multiple liability caps can be agreed. For example, parties often agree to separate caps for particular heads of loss, like data protection breaches and damage to property, which are distinct from a general cap on liability. Hi, I'm Chris Pavich, an associate in the Toronto office of DLA Piper, here to provide you with the Canadian view on limitation of liability provisions. In Canada, limitation of liability provisions tend to come in two main forms. The first is a cap on direct damages for which a party to an underlying agreement may be liable. Such caps are common in Canadian commercial agreements. Sellers, on the one hand, typically aim to define any such cap as a total amount of the purchase price under the underlying agreement. This way, in the event any damages are due due to a breach of contract by the sellers, the sellers will not be out of pocket for any amounts that exceed the amounts they received under the agreement itself. Purchasers, naturally, tend to resist the imposition of any such cap on the basis that any damage that they'd be able to claim for breach of contract would be limited to this amount. The second form of limitation of liability provisions that are common in Canada are the explicit exclusion of indirect damages. Indirect damages are not as clearly defined in Canada as they are in the United States. However, examples of indirect damages that are typically excluded from Canadian commercial agreements include consequential damages, such as lost profits, incidental damages, special damages, punitive damages, and exemplary damages. When drafting any form of limitation of liability provision, Parties should make sure to understand how any such provision interacts with any other provision in the underlying contract, especially indemnification provisions. As an example, if parties intend for any indemnity to explicitly cover all liability stemming from third party claims, thereby including consequential or indirect damages, then the parties should make sure to exclude indemnification from any limitation of liability provision that explicitly excludes the ability to make claims for indirect damages. In Canada, limitation of liability provisions are generally found to be enforceable. The enforceability of limitation of liability provisions in Canada 
has a common law jurisdiction outside of the province of Quebec is rooted in the case law. In Turkin Contractors versus the British Columbia Minister of Transportation and Highways, the Supreme Court of Canada set out a three-part test which the courts in this country typically follow when seeking to determine whether a limitation of liability provision should be enforceable. The first part of this test is based upon the ordinary contractual interpretation of the provision. In looking at this interpretation, courts must examine whether the limitation of liability provision applies to the factual circumstances at hand as established in the evidence. If the provision does not actually capture the conduct that is said to constitute the breach, there's no need to continue with the analysis. The clause itself will not be applicable in the circumstances at hand. If the clause is found to be applicable, the courts will then turn to whether or not it is unconscionable. This test involves an inquiry into the conduct of the parties at the time of contract formation, as opposed to the breach of contract. Finally, if the clause is found to be both applicable and valid, the courts will then seek to determine if there is in any event a public policy interest that favors overriding the clause that itself outweighs the general public policy interest in enforcing contractual provisions. Naturally, the onus in this instance is on the party seeking to avoid enforcement. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carolyn Big, partner in DLA Piper Greater China, and I'm going to be talking today about the position under China law. Uh, mainland China is largely a civil code framework, um, but there is also some case law that needs to be considered. Uh, and the key law to bear in mind here is the PRC contract law. But before we get to the law itself, what's really important is to understand the culture around contracting in China. Historically, it's been a very light touch approach to contracts. So contracts are often only a couple of pages long um, and uh, often without any sort of limitation or exclusion of liability clause in them. But this is slowly changing as contracting practices from uh, other parts of the world are seeping into contracting in um, China. Uh, as for the liability clauses, uh, the position under Chinese law is that if a party breaches a contract, it's liable to pay damages for other loss sustained, notwithstanding subsequent performance of the contract or a cure of any non-conforming uh, non performance. And the damages that are payable are equal to the loss that was foreseen or should have been foreseen by the breaching party at the time the contract was concluded. Uh, the innocent party has to mitigate, so has to take appropriate measures to prevent further loss, similar to some of the uh, other jurisdictions we've already talked about today. Um, and certain exclusion clauses uh, are invalid. Uh, notably, you can't exclude liability for personal injury and you can't exclude liability for loss uh, caused by deliberate acts or gross negligence. Um, Again, similar to some of the other jurisdictions we've talked about, there is this concept of fairness and reasonableness around limitation of exclusion and liability clauses. One slightly uh, unique feature to China is that the concept of an indemnity, if that's what you're using in your contracts, just isn't exactly recognised in the same way uh, under Chinese law. So if you want to have some form of protection uh, like an indemnity, you have to draft them extremely carefully. And it's more akin to a almost a liquidated damages clause, um, which are recognised within certain parameters. And you can even all, also in some circumstances have punitive damages as well. But these have to be drafted extremely carefully to be enforceable in the way that you'd expect. Finally, it's really important to remember that uh, Greater China is made up of four distinct legal jurisdictions, China, Hong Kong, Macau and, and Taiwan. So if you're contracting uh, uh, in a contract for Greater China or even a contract that just says the word China, you've got to be very clear which of those jurisdictions are within the scope. Uh, and the position on exclusion and limitation of liability is going to be different in each of them. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, the position is much more like uh, the common law position we've already heard about in Ireland uh, and Canada and, and similar to places like England and, and Singapore as well. So you have to be very careful when you're drafting uh, exclusion and limitation of liability clauses to know which is the relevant law that you're applying and therefore to be able to understand the risks around the limitation and exclusion of liability clauses.
Please do get in touch if you'd like to hear on this topic from some of our other offices um, or if you've got any ideas for other uh, topics that we can talk about in this series. Thank you for watching.